we're now going to talk about how you can combine Java's object-oriented and functional programming paradigms effectively. Earlier, we talked about some of Java's key object-oriented concepts and features, as well as some of Java's key functional concepts and features. And now we're going to talk about them again about how we can combine them. And as usual, we'll show some examples to help things be a bit more concrete. We'll also talk about how, when, and why to use mutable shared state in Java. Although this is largely discouraged, there are some times when it can be useful. And so we'll talk about when and how to do it. Java's combination of object-oriented and functional programming features is very powerful. In particular, its functional programming features can help to close the gap between a program's domain intent, in other words, the requirements it's trying to solve, and the computations that are provided to realize that domain intent. Domain intent fundamentally focuses on the what. There's a nice example that you can find in my GitHub repository called the Image Stream Gang Program. And what it does, its domain intent, is to process a list of URLs that are given by users through, say, a GUI. And these URLs point to images that aren't already cached. And the ones that aren't already cached in that list of URLs will be downloaded, transformed by image processing, and stored locally on the computing device. And all of this processing will take place in parallel. So that's basically the requirements that we're trying to satisfy. So that's the, the what. The computations, of course, define the how. That's how we actually realize the domain intent or satisfy the requirements. Here's a little code snippet, which you can see if you take a look at the code in the image stream gang example on my GitHub repository, where we take a list of URLs, we convert it into a parallel stream, we filter out anything that's already been cached earlier. So we just want to download new images. We then download these non-cached images, and we go ahead and we apply various filters to transform them. And then we collect the results into a list which will be stored locally on the device. So this is an illustration of how the computations that are done in a declarative model, in a functional programming model, really mirror the domain intent, which is the, the what. So you can see these things really connecting domain intent and computations in a way that's fairly easy to read once you understand the mysteries of the syntax and semantics of Java functional programming. Likewise, Java's object-oriented features also play an important role in non-trivial programs because they help to structure a program's software architecture. If you take a look at the link at the bottom of the slide, you'll see a discussion of the so-called four plus one model of software architecture, which deals with various views, the logical view, the physical view, the process view, the development view, and the use case view. We're going to focus our attention on the so-called logical view, which is the view that depicts the subsystems, the packages, and the classes that exhibit architecturally important structure and behavior. So just for example, going back to our image stream gang program, we have a number of very important structures that we have here. And we illustrate those using Java's object-oriented features, such as superclasses or interfaces and so on, that are then related to each other through inheritance and polymorphism. So for example, we have common superclasses that provide a reasonable foundation for extensibility in the image stream gang architecture. We have something called the stream gang abstract base class, which is inherited and extended to make an image stream. And then we can have different kinds of subclasses that are going to derive from that, as we'll see in a moment. Likewise, we can have something called a filter, which is the base class or the superclass for a bunch of filters that can be applied. And then it's very straightforward to use subclassing, which is a classic Java object-oriented feature, to extend the common classes, the reusable foundations, to create various custom implementation strategies. So we might have one variant that will process things sequentially. We might have another subclass variant that will process things using parallel streams. We might have yet another variant that processes them using Java's asynchronous completable futures or RxJava or Project Reactor's reactive streams, and so on and so forth. Fourth. And similar things apply with filters. We can have filters that will be a grayscale filter or a null filter or a tint filter and so on and so forth. And we can relate those things together using inheritance and dynamic binding to make the architecture much more extensible. In my experience, Java's functional programming features are most effective when they're used in the context of its object-oriented features. So you can simplify the computations within the context of a nice, well-designed and extensible and modular object-oriented software architecture. So it's a really great combination. And this is particularly true when we start talking about concurrent and parallel programs, where if you're not careful, the complexity of the software architecture can get 
diminished and made very convoluted if you don't know what you're doing. So once again, objects and functional programming paradigms work very nicely when used together in Java's hybrid programming model. The last topic I want to talk about here is when, why, and how to use mutable state in Java. Since Java is a hybrid language, there are actually situations where mutable state or changes to shared state, changes to shared state that may be shared between different threads, in fact, are allowed and even encouraged in some cases. And probably the best example of this would be Java's collection framework. If you're familiar with Java, you know it has this collection framework, which includes all kinds of abstract data type implementations, things like hash sets and array lists and various types of maps, hash map and tree map and so on and so forth. Many of which were developed well before the functional features were added to Java. So of course, the whole concept of mutable shared state is very, very common in those existing libraries and frameworks. Some of which actually are very cleverly designed to work effectively for concurrent programs, such as concurrent hash map, which we'll talk quite a bit about as we get further into the lessons. However, you're usually better off in modern Java minimizing or ideally avoiding the use of mutable shared state in your programs. So even though you may end up having to use some of these Java collection framework components and classes that have mutable shared state, you probably want to avoid doing that in your code. Now, when you can't avoid it, when there are situations where you really need to share stuff between, say, multiple threads, be very careful and protect yourself by using some of Java's synchronizers or synchronized collections, or even better in many cases, it's concurrent collections, such as concurrent hash map. So if you end up needing to use synchronizers, then you want to use things like atomic operations, mutual exclusion, things like reentrant lock and so on, coordination mechanisms like condition object, barrier synchronizers like countdown latch and cyclic barrier and so on. Now, if you're really curious about these, I have lots and lots of videos on my YouTube channel that go into great detail about all this stuff. It's beyond the scope of this discussion to go into it in detail, but take a look at the link at the bottom of the slide if you want a primer on many of these core Java synchronizers. So that's the end of the overview of our discussion about how you can combine Java's object-oriented and functional programming paradigms effectively in practice to get the best of both worlds in modern Java's hybrid model.